Amen. Well, hey, thank you guys so much for being here again. Uh, Super excited about this. We are moving forward in the book of James. This series has been awesome. Have you guys enjoyed this series? Come on. It's been so good, and we're going to continue moving forward in this today, uh, and we will be wrapping up this series, uh, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after. Uh, like they said in the announcement, uh, next Sunday is Vision Sunday, and so just want to let you know it's a, it's a great opportunity to come in and hear a little bit more uh, in depth about what God is doing here specifically at Grace, and how we as a church want to jump in and follow his leading, follow what, the work that he is doing, um, because when God moves, we should follow, right? Uh, so that's what we want to do. So make sure you're here next week, Vision Sunday. It's going to be so much fun. Um, but today, We're going to talk about James some more, and today we're going to be jumping in uh, the end, kind of middle end of chapter four of James and a little bit of the beginning of chapter five. And so what I want to do to start the the message today is I just want to read this section, okay? And it's a big chunk, so stick with me, but it's really good stuff, okay? So we're going to read through this big section real quick, and then we're going to talk about it. So here we go. Uh, We're at James four, verse 11 is where we're starting. If you have your Bible, pull that out. got your phone, great. If not, we've got it on the screens right here. So let's follow along. It says, don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone, who gave the law, is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? Look here, you who say today or tomorrow we are going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We'll do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. When you ought to say, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans, and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do than not to do it. Chapter 5, look here, you rich people. Weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away, and your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags. Your gold and silver are corroded. The very wealth you were counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. For listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pay. The cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of heaven's armies. You have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. You have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter. Dang. What a way to start it off. Maybe you came to church today and you're like, hey, maybe James is going to chill out this week. Psych! You know what I'm saying? And James is like, still got more. Guess what? Here it is in the hardest way possible. Um, so yeah, James is saying a lot here. And he's saying a lot of heavy stuff. And it, he can feel just like a ton of weight when we hear and read what he's saying. Um, and, and if we're being real, as we read through this, there's a lot of different ideas, a lot of different things that James is talking about that can take us a lot of different directions, okay? Um, but today, uh, what I want to do is I want to break down what we just read because I do believe that he's going in one direction as a whole. I think there's a place that we can kind of get to. So let's, let's, let's explain what he's talking about. Let's see what he's really saying. Uh, in the NLT translation and in a few other uh, translations of this passage that we just read, it's actually split up into three sections, okay? Three different sections. The first one, verses 11 and 12, is titled, Warning Against Judging Others, okay? A warning to the reader against judging others. James says things like, don't speak evil against each other. Don't criticize and judge each other. What right do you have to judge others? God alone is judge. Don't be that judgmental person. Don't place yourself above the other people around you in your life. Don't place yourself in a place that only God is supposed to be in as judge. In fact, James says, if you judge each other, what you're actually doing is judging God's law. You're judging God's way and what God says about his people. So what you're actually doing when you're judging is saying, hey, I'm not on the same level as these people around me. I'm not agreeing, I'm disagreeing with God's law and saying they're worse than I am or I am better than they are. Don't do that. Here's your warning. First warning, don't do it. The second is a warning against self-confidence. This is verses 13 and 17 in chapter four. Don't go thinking that you've got the best plan for yourself. Don't lie to yourself and make yourself believe that this plan of yours is fail-proof. Oh, it's, it's gonna work it'll be fine. It's going to work just right. 
just like I planned. Don't think that you know what the future holds. Instead, maybe invite God in. Maybe rely on him and let him lead the way. In fact, James says, if you don't seek God's will in his way over your own, what you're actually doing is boasting. And all that boasting is evil. What you're actually doing is having an overwhelming amount of self-confidence, too much self-confidence in yourself, in your own wisdom, in what you're capable of. And such boasting is evil. And in case you forgot at the end, James lets us know, if you know what you should do and you don't do it, that's sinning. There's your second warning. The third is a warning to rich oppressors. Okay, this is in chapter five, verses one through five. Don't count on the wealth that you've acquired in this life. Don't hoard the riches of this world and don't live to just satisfy your worldly desires and wants. It's not, about what, it's not all about what you can acquire. It's not about what benefits you and you alone. In fact, James says, if you do these things, if you rely only on the things of this world and what benefits you and prioritize them as most important, in the end, you'll actually be left with nothing. In the end, it'll all be rotted and corroded and destroyed and it won't matter. You'll be left with nothing but brokenness, nothing but problems. Three warnings. Again, this is a lot from James, and he comes out swinging today. Happy That's right, happy fourth. So what are we supposed to focus on? What, what is James really getting at here? Because again, we can go so many different directions with what he's saying. There's so many different things that we can focus on. But I think today, what, what, what I feel like God wants us to see is actually one word, one word to describe James' goal in this passage. One thing that James really wants us to dig deep on and focus on, and that word is humility. Can everybody say humility? Humility, Humility, right? If you joined us last week for service, Pastor Josh uh, talked a little bit about conflict, not a little bit, a good amount of it, (laughs) uh, on conflict, and he dug into what it looked like to have that humility in conflicts with our spouse, in our relationships. And so today what I want to do is I want to continue that conversation. I want to move forward, but with a deeper focus on humility itself, because I think that we often have a twisted perspective on what real and true humility actually is. I think it's important for us to figure out what it is so that we're not left in this place like James talks about with the brokenness, with nothing. But we have to figure out what that true humility actually is, because God's heart for us is that we would be humble. God's heart for us is that we would have humility. 1 Peter 5.5 5 says, And all of you, dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God's heart is that we would be humble. We would be humble under his authority, and we would be humble as we relate to one another. It's important. But again, to do that, we have to understand what true humility looks like. So what I want to do today is I want to combat some lies, Okay. I think there's two big lies that we are told that we hear or that we often believe about humility or about ourselves that keep us from understanding and living in a way of true humility. And so I want to combat those lies with truth from God's word so that we can better understand how we're called to walk as humble followers of Jesus. So uh, the first one that I have, the first lie, okay, so we're going to start is, I am better than, okay, that's lie number one. I am better than. Have you ever heard that before? Maybe you said it. Maybe somebody else that you're, you've been around has said it. I am better than. This first lies where I feel like James is actually hitting home real hard in that passage that we just read in those three sections of Scripture. Um, I think this is where we can begin to see in this first lie of I am better than the kind of people that, that James is talking about in that first passage, okay? So again, back to those, those three sections. Somebody who believes this lie that I am better than might be, like James says, a, ju- a judgmental person. A person who judges on action. A person who thinks what they did was so wrong. Shame on them. Someone who thinks, wow, what they did, they're way worse than I am. Because of what they did, I am better than they are. This person is like we talked about earlier. Is This is the person who is going against God's law, who is judging God's law and saying that your guilt, your amount of guilt is way worse than mine. The amount of shame that you should have, 
is way more than I should have. You've done way worse. I'm placing myself up here and you're down here. A judgmental person. Maybe they judge on appearance. Maybe they judge on opinion. But they judge, judge, judge when it's not their place. You are way worse and I am better than. This is also like he talks about in the next section, an egotistical planner. Somebody, like we said, who is overconfident in their self. Somebody who's overconfident in their own plans and wisdoms and says, hey, my plan is going to work out. I know what I'm doing. I've got it all, okay? I can handle this. It's all good. I can do this. And not only can I do this, but my plan, that person, that egotistical planner, if, they're, if we're being real, their plan in the long run is probably only going to go to benefit them. It's all about them. And then the third one, the rich oppressor, what he talks about in chapter five, they are stuck on worldly wealth. How much can I get for myself? How much can I keep and hoard for me? They live to satisfy their selfish wants and desires. There's no generosity or just very, very small little amounts of it. It's about them. It's about satisfying what they want, meeting their wants and desires. These types of people, somebody who's in one of these spots, or maybe all of them, is somebody who more than likely believes the lie that I am better than. I am better than. Then. And these could all be different people, right? Like we, we, th- These all can be totally different people. But again, the ultimate goal for today is to understand that anybody in this spot, any, any person there is actually somebody struggling with one thing just like everybody else, and that is humility. They're struggling with being the humble person that God has called them to be. We've all been there. We've all had that struggle. So somebody that I think we should look at to help us get a better example of who this is and to help us get to a place where we understand the truth about what God says about this lie of I am better than is Jonah, okay? Uh, If you were here at Grace a few years ago, a couple years ago, we went through a series on Jonah. It was a ton of fun. Uh, But I want to talk about the story of Jonah today. We know, know, who knows who Jonah is? Come on, let me see hands. Jonah got swallowed by a big fish. You know what I'm saying? Like there's tons of songs, but that's who we're going to dig into today. So if you don't know the story, it goes a little bit like this. Uh, There was a prophet, okay? Uh, A man of God uh, named Jonah. He was somebody that God spoke to so that Jonah could go and speak to God's people to tell him what God wanted, to tell the people what God had for them, what he wanted them to do, uh, to speak on behalf of the Lord. That's what Jonah did. Uh, He was part of uh, Israel, God's chosen people. Uh, Well, one day God comes to Jonah. He's like, hey, Jonah, there's this city, Nineveh, okay? Uh, And in Nineveh right now, they're not doing great, okay? To tell you the truth, they're doing terrible. In fact, they've done so much bad that what I need you to do is I need you to go there and warn them and tell them that I'm about to bring some of my wrath, some of my destruction, and basically my judgment on them because they have not done great. They're, go tell them they're in big trouble, okay? Go to Nineveh. So immediately, if you know the story, what Jonah does is he doesn't go that way. <laughs> he completely disobeys God and he runs the absolute opposite direction. He's trying to head to a place called Tarshish, okay? He's like, I'm not going there, God. I'm, I'm getting out of here. And if you follow the story, what happens is Jonah's running from God and the calling that God has placed on his life in this time. And he, he ends up getting on this ship with some sailors and uh, they're on the ship and he's running from God. And, and the, this huge storm in the ocean starts to happen and, and the sailors are freaking out and Jonah's laying downstairs like, yep, you know. <laughs> and it's going crazy and all the sailors kind of come to a conclusion like figuring out, okay, why is this so bad? Obviously God's causing this to happen. Why is he causing it to happen? Who's like, they're pointing, you know, the Spider-Man meme where everybody's like, whose fault is it? It's like, they're trying to figure that out. They're like, Who, who's doing it? And they come to the conclusion, it's that guy. It's Jonah, the dude who's chilling downstairs, who's not as stressed as we are. So Jonah's like, you're right, you got me. Uh, maybe you should throw me over. You know what I mean? And like, they're like, okay. <laughs> so they're like, yeah, let's do it. So they take Jonah and he's like, wait, bad idea. And they take Jonah and they throw him over into the ocean. And, and the, immediately when he hits the water and he starts to drown, everything chills out. And they're like, whoo. <laughs> and Jonah's like, not whoo. He's drowning in the water, right? Little did Jonah know that God had set up uh, a plan, <laughs> uh, a safety measure uh, with a big fish. Uh, so a big fish comes along and the fish swallows Jonah. So Jonah is inside this fish. So Jonah's drowning, thinks he's about to die. And God sends a fish, okay, to save him. And he lives inside this fish. He's in there for three days and three nights, okay? Pretty disgusting. Um, But one thing that happens is while Jonah is in the fish, and this is important because we're going to circle back to this, um, he kind of comes to a place of like, okay, maybe I was in the wrong. 
Maybe I should have just obeyed God and I was running, but the truth is, is God is good and God just saved me and I got to honor God and I got to pray. So he begins to give God praise. Like he, he tells, he says that salvation comes from the Lord, right? Salvation comes from the Lord alone. God has saved me. God, you're a good God. I thank you. He's thanking God for his mercy, for his grace, for his kindness. He's like, you're so good. Thank you for being so kind. And so what, go, what happens is the fish gets to a shore. It spits Jonah out and then God comes to Jonah again and gives him a second chance. He's like, all right, let's try this again. Jonah, I need you to go to Nineveh, okay? I need you to go there. You ran away the first time. I need you to go there, and I need you to tell these people what I told you the first time. I'm bringing some judgment on them, that they're in, they're in big trouble. This time, Jonah's like, all right, <laughs> I don't feel like drowning or getting eaten by fish again. I'm on the way. So Jonah heads to Nineveh, and when he gets there, he starts telling all the people. He's walking through the streets of Nineveh, and it's a huge place. He's telling them what what God has told him to tell them, and he's basically saying, hey, you guys got 40 days. Just want to let you know, you got 40 days, and at the end of the 40 days, God's judgment is going to come upon you, okay? He's going to destroy this place, and you're in trouble, so uh, get ready. So the people of Nineveh, they actually respond in a completely opposite way than expected, right? Like, maybe you'd expect a city who's just, like, doesn't care, whatever. Like the people in Nineveh were considered a ruthless people. Like they, they did their own thing. Like sinners in a foreign land is how they like, they're just doing their own thing. Dangerous, crazy, right? And so Jonah's in there, he's telling this, and they actually respond in a way of, oh no, God's going to bring his judgment. God's going to bring his wrath here. We're, we're in trouble. And so what they decide to do, and it actually, it actually eventually get the word gets to the king of Nineveh, and he, he kind of sends out like this royal decree, hey, we're, we're, we're all going to fast, like, we're going to beg God for his mercy and his grace, and we're going to put our attention on him right now. Even the animals, you know what I'm saying? The cows are like, bro, what? You know, it's like, so he, he sends it out to all of them. Like, no, we're all going to be like, God, please do not, do not destroy us. Forgive us. So they do that, and here's what happens. Here's how God responds to the, to the Ninevites' response to what Jonah said. In Jonah 3.10, says, When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. He changed his mind. I love that. Here's where we see this lie, the I am better than, come to life in Jonah. Okay? So then Jonah, God does this, and then Jonah comes to God. Here's what it says, Jonah 4, verses 2 and 3. Jonah says, this "This change of plans greatly upset Jonah. He became very angry with God. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. I I like that verse right there is so funny to me. It's like he's like so mad at God, but he's also complimenting him. Oh, you're so good. You love us. So stupid. It's just, it's hilarious. He says, you're eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, God. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. Jonah is mad. Jonah is big mad. But if you're somebody sitting on the outside and as we read this, you, you got to ask the question, what, why would Jonah be mad? Why would he be mad that God wanted to show grace and kindness and mercy to somebody? Isn't Jonah a prophet? Isn't his job to do what God tells him to do, to speak? Because isn't God's heart to, to love people? You know what I mean? Isn't God's heart to save his people? Why would Jonah be mad about this? I believe it's because Jonah believes this lie, that he is better than. I believe that Jonah believes he is better than the Ninevites, and he does not like them at all. Why is that? few reasons, okay? One, like I said before, the Ninevites were seen as a dangerous and ruthless and powerful people. Jonah wasn't that way. He didn't live his life the way that he did. He disagreed with them, didn't like what they did. Jonah, again, was a prophet. He's like a pastor in the day, okay? He went around. He's a part of God's chosen, a religious person of Israel, of God's chosen people. They were not God's chosen people. They were, in, in, in his eyes and so many others, sinners in a foreign land, like we said, they, they weren't them. So then when God calls Jonah and Jonah runs from God's calling, I don't think that he runs from God's calling in the beginning to try to get to Tarshish because he's afraid of what the Ninevites might do to him. Like maybe there's a little bit of that, like this could be kind of bad for me. But 
I think the ultimate reason is because Jonah is afraid of what God might do for the Ninevites. He explains that back in, in, in verse 2, Jonah 4, 2. Didn't I say, again, this weird compliment, but also anger. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn your back from destroying people. It's so funny. Jonah is so mad that God showed the Ninevites grace. Yet he's the same person who was just in the belly of a fish praising God for being a, merc- a merciful father. Praising God saying, salvation comes from you. You are so good. Thanks for being the God who comes in and takes care of us. Thanks for showing us kindness and grace. And then he does it for these other people and he's like, what are you doing? It's like, God, why, why would you save them? Why would you help them? You help me, that's fine. But why would you help them? Jonah is mad. Jonah thinks he's better than them. He thinks he's more important. He thinks the calling God has placed on him. He thinks his guilt is less. He thinks, he thinks he's in a better spot. He believes the lie that he is better than the Ninevites. He's more worthy of God's grace and kindness. He has the right to judge them because he is chosen Jonah thinks he's better and he's mad. Here's God's response. And this is so cool. After Jonah throws his fit, he's done with his tantrum. You know what I mean? I think God kind of gives him a minute and then responds. You know, like you have that kid at home who's like, nah, going crazy. And you're like, you done? You know what I mean? You all right? Need some water? You know, it's like, take a break. Here's what God says to Jonah in verse four. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? it. Is it right for you to be angry about this? And if we're Jonah, and what I think Jonah does, like, if we might respond like, well, what do you mean is it right? Yeah, again, I'm, I'm up here. They're down here. Of course it's right. They're not God's chosen people. They're not, if, we're, if we believe this lie, it seems right. But I think to get out of that place, what we need to do is we need to rephrase the question that God is asking. See, what I think God really wanted Jonah to see is what right do you have? Jonah, what right? That's, that's the question he's asking. What right do you have to be angry about this? Why is it okay for you to see this? Because you're a sinner too. Anybody else in here a sinner? I am. You ever messed up? I have. You ever messed up real bad? I have. We all have. We've all made mistakes. Romans 3.23 says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. That's what I think God wanted Jonah to see. He's like, Jonah, yeah, I've I've placed a calling on your life, right? You're great. I love you. But you're not better than them. You too are a sinner. At the foot of the cross, we are all the same. The only one that's better is Jesus. We're all sinners. We've all sinned got mess. Has anybody ever seen uh, Toy Story 4? Come on. Great movie, yeah? All the Toy Stories, just classics, right? Come on. Even parents, like we can't deny that sometimes we just want to sit and watch Toy Story. I do. It's great. Well, if you've seen Toy Story 4, there's this new character added in the movie. His name is Forky, okay? Yeah, come on. Forky is a spork, (laughs) Um, that is made with like some random twisties for arms and some like popsicle sticks for feet with some glue and googly eyes that aren't the same size. And he's strange looking, but he's loved. Um, so he's brought into this and he, the, the, the girl in the story um, who owns the toys in, in Toy Story 4 name is Bonnie. So she makes Forky and he becomes a toy and she loves Forky so much. Well, um, Forky was made from trash. So Forky does not understand that he's a toy uh, and he consistently is trying to get back in the trash. He's like, I'm trash. So he wants to jump back in the trash over and over and over again. Woody uh, has reached this place where he kind of realizes that he's not a toy that's a favorite anymore. And so, but, but he still wants, still wants Bonnie. He still wants their kid to be happy. So he's like, I, I want to make sure that Forky's here. I got to take care of Forky so that Bonnie will be 
happy. And so he makes it like his goal. Well, the family, Bonnie's family decides to go on this trip. Okay. You guys, most of you guys are like, know what I'm talking about. You've seen the movie, but they go on this trip and they rent an RV and they're in the RV and somehow Forky gets to an open window in the RV and jumps out when they're on the road. And so Woody's like, ah, and so Woody jumps out too after Forky, okay? So he finally finds him, uh, and he gets Forky, and they're in, like, on this road in the middle of the woods, and they're, Woody's trying to get Forky back to Bonnie, okay? He's like, I got to get you back. Like, it's important. And he's trying to explain to Forky why it's important, all this stuff. And while they're walking back, they actually have, like, this heart-to-heart conversation. It's really, really cool. Um, but they're talking, and Woody actually ends up, like, venting to Forky about, like, why he's upset, why he feels, he's, he feels unimportant. He feels useless, Okay? He's in this space of like, I just kind of feel like I don't matter anymore. Right? Um, and Forky's response, just great words of wisdom and encouragement. Here's what he says. He says, Woody, I know what your problem is. You're just like me. Trash. <laughs> Here's the deal. <laughs> Stick with me. Okay? Hear me all the way through. Sometimes... I think it's important for us as followers of Jesus, as God's people, as people he's created, every person to be reminded that we're just like each other. We're all trash. (laughs) Does my pastor just call me trash? Yes and no. Okay. A little bit. Just a little bit. Me too. I'm garbage. Okay. But here's the deal. My, My point is not to degrade you to make you feel like less than, to to make you feel bad or or worse about yourself. It's nothing like that. My point is to remind us, again, the point that we see from Jonah that we get that God wants him to see is we all have mess. That is the truth to combat that first lie. I'm better than, no, 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 no. You have mess too. I have mess too. We all have mess. We all have things that we've done that we shouldn't have. We all have sin. Again, we are all sinners and our guilt level is the same in the heart and eyes of Jesus Christ. We all have mess. And that's, Forky's not trying to tell Woody that he's, he's garbage. Out. He, that he's trying to hit home. He's like, I, I can relate. We've all got our stuff. That's what God wanted Jonah to know. That's what God wants us to know. We all have mess. My plan should not be more important than yours. My sin should not be less than yours in my eyes. I should not be seen as more loved or better than you. My success should not be more important than yours. Your mistakes and your sins don't make you worse or or less loved by God and by anybody else. We all have our stuff. We all have our mess. And here's another thing. 1 Peter 4.10 says this, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Because we're all here What God has called us to do, like he called Jonah, is to love one another. Love each other the same way, to serve one another, to take care of one another. God's blessed you. Great. God's built you up. Maybe God's given you wealth. Whatever the case, guess what? It's not just for you. Sometimes that's real hard. It's not just for you. God wants to see you change the world. God has called you to bring the kingdom here to make a difference but we've got to love each other. We have to understand that we all have mess, that in God's heart, we're all loved the same way. It's important. We've got to love each other and serve each other. So again, the truth to combat lie number one, I am better than, is no, 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 no. I have mess too. I have a mess too. Okay, lie number two. Lie number two is I am worse than, okay? This Sounds weird, but stick with me, okay? I don't, I don't think uh, that in, in the text that we just read, I really feel like what we read and what we just talked about, this I am more than or I am better than, that's really what James is hitting home on. But this next lie I think is so important because I think it's the flip side to this conversation on humility, a place that we can get to, a dangerous place that we can get to, that God has called us to not be in um, when it comes to being humble people, okay? Um, so it's I am worse than. So this lie actually stems from the place we were just talking about, remembering our mess, okay? Remembering that we have mess because here's the issue. Something that we've been taught in the world and culture is like the humble person is the person who can go, oh, I'm a screw up. The humble person is the person who go, yeah, I'm, I'm nothing. I'm no good. 
It's like, wow, they're so humble. Wow, they, they, they must, they've got humility down. That is not humility. That's a hard thing, okay? This is the hard truth. Beating yourself up and hating yourself and seeing yourself as less than or worse than is not humility. That is a lie. That is a lie from hell that the enemy wants you to believe. He wants you to think you're nothing. You've got nothing. That's his goal. Let me destroy your hope. Let me destroy your value, your worth. That is not humility. And we do that. You know what I mean? Like, oh, it's cool. He just, he's just trying to be humble. He's just trying. It's like, no, he's, he's believing lies. That is not humility. Here's what C.S. Lewis says about humility. He says, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Humility is not saying, I'm nothing. I'm, I'm just a broken, just I'm trash. That's not it. He's saying, it's just thinking of yourself less. It's not being consumed by yourself. Because we do that. When, when we're in that place where we're just like, I'm nothing, I'm not, it's not humility. We're, we're still, if you recognize it, you're still all about you. And I get it. Like, it may be unintentional, but your only focus is you still. That's not being humble. You are consumed by yourself and your brokenness. That's not humility, and that is absolutely not God's heart for you. That is not his desire for his people. He does not want you to feel like nothing. He does not want you to think you're only trash. That is not his goal for you to focus on that because it's a lie and it's all about us still. Timothy Keller calls what C.S. Lewis is saying self-forgetfulness, okay? Self-forgetfulness. And he gives us this image to, to kind of better understand. So imagine if you're talking to someone. If you are, if you talk to someone, have a conversation with someone who is truly humble, what's going to happen is they won't spend the whole conversation telling you about how broken and how bad they are and, and, and trying to convince you of how humble they are. No, 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 no. Because again, it's all about them. If you walk away from a conversation with a, a truly humble person, what you're going to walk away remembering is how interested they were in you. How much you mattered in that conversation, not them. Self-forgetfulness. Like the gift of self-forgetfulness. The peace and the rest that it brings. Because I'm not consumed by me. You see, the, the, the ultimate thing that we need to see is, is, is we need to realize that we don't have to be all about us. We don't have to be consumed with ourselves because God already is. Humility is not saying I'm, I'm worse than. Humility is saying God says I am good. Humility is focusing on what God says, not what we say, not what the world says about us. We have to re realize and remember what God says about us. We have to realize and remember that God is all about us. We cannot forget that. We cannot forget that we are loved, that we are loved in the craziest of ways, a love that just cannot be compared or matched. It's God's love for us. That is how much he loves us, and we can't forget it. First John 4, uh, 9 and 10 says, this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. God loved us first. That's his love. He's saying, yeah, you're, sure, like Forky said, we all, we're all some trash. But man, I love you. And that's how we should see it can't go, oh, I'm, I'm just the trash. I'm nothing. I'm not. We have to bring in God's love. We cannot forget his love because it is his words. It is who he says we are. It's the worth that he says we have that should matter. That's the truth. It makes me think of Peter. <clears throat> we all know Peter, right? This is the guy that followed Jesus, cut off somebody's ear, and then denied Jesus <laughs> uh, three times. After Jesus said, you're going to do it, he's like, no, I won't. Did it. Come on, dude. We all, we've all got our stuff. But Peter, after Jesus uh, dies and before he knows he's resurrected, he gets in this place that a lot of the disciples think, oh, it's over. You know what I mean? Like, that's it. They're lost. They're broken, confused. And Peter, along with a few others, they, they kind of just go back to what they were doing before. So Peter goes back to fishing. And he's out on a boat, and Jesus shows up. A resurrected Jesus shows up on the shore. And at first, they don't know it's him, but eventually it comes a place where they're like, oh, that's Jesus. He's back, you know, and they all start freaking out. And I'm thinking, like, everybody else, like, I'm sure everybody's excited. Like, Scripture says Peter jumps in the water, and he's going, he's going, he's going, he's catching, to Jesus, like, trying to get to Jesus. But I think, like, deep down, Peter probably felt like that kid who made a really bad choice, and, like, mom and dad, like, were like, 
like knew about it and they're like, you think they remember? You know what I mean? Like, you think they remember I did that thing? Maybe they don't, you know? And like, so maybe like he's like excited, like, huh, but he's like really hoping Jesus doesn't bring up the fact that he denied him three times. And so what happens is they sit on the shore uh, and they start eating breakfast together. And I'm, they're just, I'm sure they're just talking, having a conversation. And like, I picture Peter sitting behind like one of the other disciples, like kind of leaning over to see if Jesus is looking his way every now and then. Like, does he remember, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> and eventually Jesus, he calls out to Peter. You know, you're Peter, you're just pounding like huh what's up and here's here's what here's what's going on in this moment what we need to see about peter is peter is consumed by himself peter is consumed with the mistakes that he's made peter's like i'm garbage i denied god and he remembers it and he's about to tell me that i'm nothing that that that, that, that like i'm a horrible person i'm it's all about him he's stuck on his own sin it's all that matters. It's all he can see. It's all he can focus on. But then Jesus comes in. He says, hey, Peter, you love me? He's like, you know I love you. Jesus is like, cool. Go feed my sheep. Do you love me? Of course. Go take care of my lambs. Do you love me? Of course. Take care of my people. Lead them do what I have called you to do. You see, what Jesus does is he doesn't come in and put the focus on Peter's sin and his shame and, and, and say, you're worse than. He, he doesn't let Peter believe that lie. And so he takes the focus off of that and he says, hey, Peter, I'm enough. Hey, Peter, I love you. Hey, Peter, I've called you. I know you messed up. Guess what? Let's keep going. I know you made a mistake. Guess what? It's in the past keep moving forward. He's not focused on Peter's sin. He's not focused on his mistake. He's, he's reminding Peter and he wants Peter to focus on the fact that his love for Peter is enough. His grace, his mercy, his kindness, it is enough. It doesn't matter what Peter's done. Take the focus off. That's what God wants for us today, church. He says, stop believing this, this lie that, that, that you're worse than and believe that I am enough believe that my love for you is enough. It was before, before anything you've ever did, every, anything, before when I knew you were going to be a sinner, before you cleaned yourself up, before any, I loved you. It's not about what you can do. It's about the fact that I love you and my love is enough. That's the truth to combat. Again, Jesus is enough. The truth to combat the second lie, the second lie that I am worse than. Jesus is is enough. The sacrifice that he made for me, it's enough. The love that he has for me, it's enough. What he says about me, the truth, it's enough. And when I believe that, when I can cling to that, I no longer have to live in this, this backwards place of humility and just tell myself that I'm nothing and beat myself up and assume that that's how I'm supposed to live my life. But instead I can walk in confidence of who God says I am. And I can live my life and pursue the calling he has placed on me. And on my life, my focus should not be on me and my sin. It should be on Jesus and on who he says I am and what he has called me to do because he is enough. And he says, I am enough. That's what matters. So where is true humility found? It's found in this tension, okay? In this, in this, this middle ground between I have a mess. I've made mistakes. I've, I've done things I shouldn't have done. I've done really bad things that I shouldn't have done, God. But because I am loved so much, I'm made worthy. I have a mess, but because I'm loved, I'm worthy. Because Jesus' love is enough. Jesus is enough to make me worthy. What my Heavenly Father says about me is enough. I don't need more and I don't need less. So today, as we head out, and as we begin to pursue this, this true walk in humility and, and, and be the people that God has called us to be, obviously we're not going to be perfect, but as we pursue that goal of walking that tension, of I've got issues, maybe a little trash, but I'm loved and I'm worthy. 
I want to give us a step that we can take, okay? And I think that this step is important because not only does it, it help us to walk out humility physically, actively in our lives, but I think it's almost a test for some of us. If we're in here, we're like, I don't really know how bad I am with this whole, like, whole thing about being humble. I, don't, I feel like I'm okay at it. I feel, I feel like I do all right. Or, or maybe you're like, I just don't know. I feel like I kind of don't care. It's like, try this out. Let God reveal to you the importance of this and how, how big it actually is, okay? So what we need to do is we need to go. The step that we need to take is go and do something that's not about you. When you leave today, throughout this week, look for opportunities to do things that are not about you. Again, this doesn't mean that you don't matter. You're loved by God, and that's what matters. But we all matter. We're all loved by God, and we're all called to love each other that same way. So go out and do something that's not about you. Go out and serve somebody. Use the gifts that God has given you to treat people the way he has called you to. Step out and help a, a single mom. Come and serve uh, some, some kiddos on, 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 in students or kids or on Sundays or help serve at the church. Go, go somewhere in the community. Go, go to, the, to the local food bank. Go, go love people. Look for those opportunities to do things that aren't about you. Look for things that, that don't benefit you when you're done. That in the end, it's like, hey, I'm, whew, I'm tired. I poured out, and th that's all I did. I didn't, I didn't receive this back. I didn't pour out. Because th there's this really cool thing about God is whenever we do that and we give of ourselves and we serve, He pours back into us. He takes care of us because He's enough. We don't have to be about us. He is, and He's enough. So go be about somebody else. Go be about something else. Go, go help a, a struggling family. Go help uh, uh, some parents with their kiddos. In fact, you want to lose some time? Go have some kids, okay? Then you really won't have time. <laughs> Go do something that's not about you. Can we stand? The la last thing before we pray. And this is like something that I've kind of like gone back and forth with, but I think it's an, another good kind of test for us in regards to humility. Sometimes we often think humility, again, is like, is this closed in box of like just treating other people, random people in our lives well. But if you read through scripture, God often tells us to treat everybody well. Amen. To love everybody, even our enemies, even the people who have hurt us the people who have done us so wrong. And if, if we can be honest, the people who don't deserve that, but neither do we. And so one, one good test in this, in this walk of humility and, and strengthening it and really finding that true place of humility, walking that tension well, take, take verses like John three sixteen, for God so loved the world. And take verses like Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you. Good things, love from God value to us from God. Take out the world, take out you, and put the name of the person who's hurt you in those verses. For God so loved them. For God knows the plans he has for them because they matter too. If we're struggling with humility, maybe one thing we need to do is really get down because I, I feel like forgiveness and humility often go hand in hand. We need, to, we need to let God heal us from those broken places that we can become truly humble people who say, hey, even if you've broken my heart before, I still praise God for you. And I still pray that God moves in your life. It's not just, it's not just oh, God, I pray for them. Hope it gets better. It's like, God, I want good things. I want your plans for them. That's, that's humility. It's a challenge and it's hard, but God's got it. Jesus is enough. Let's pray, church. Jesus, I thank you so much for today. God, I thank you for every person in this room. I thank you for all of our family online, God. Um, I'm thankful for this church. God, I'm thankful for the family here. God, it's hard on both ends of the spectrum of humility, God, to sometimes feel like we're more than others, God, that, that the damage they've done is way worse, God, and to place ourselves above, above them. And maybe it's not our intentions, God, but we do it. Or maybe it's the other side, God, of where we just feel like we're too messed up. We've messed up so bad, God, that there's no way that we can be considered equal to those around us, God, that there were nothing, God, and we believe the lies. I'm better than, I'm worse than. I pray today that those lies are broken and gone in the name of Jesus forever and every, for every heart in this room and online, Jesus. That instead, the thing that we remember is that you're enough. You're love, you're grace, you're kindness, you're mercy that you showed to the Ninevites, that you showed to Jonah, that you showed to Peter. It's enough. 
for me, for them, for everybody. You are enough, Jesus. We love you and we thank you. Help us to find true humility in our hearts and in our lives. Help us to walk it out. Help us to do things that are not about us, God, but about everybody. Help us to love those around us, God, so that they can know you, so they can know your heart and who you are and how much you love them. You're enough. We worship you. We praise you. We thank you. It's in your perfect name. And everybody said, amen.